Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Chris Christensen. I am a podcaster with Politics Out West, and today we're going to read the Omaha Platform. The Omaha Platform was the party program adopted at the formative convention of the Populist or People's Party held in Omaha, Nebraska on July 4th of 1892. So, just reading from Wikipedia, a little bit of background. The platform preamble was written by Ignatius Donnelly. The Omaha platform was seen as the second declaration of independence as it called for reestablishing American liberty. The planks themselves represent the merger of the agrarian concerns of the Farmers Alliance with the free currency monetarism of the Greenback Party while explicitly endorsing the goals of the largely urban Knights of Labor. In the words of Donnelly's preamble, the convention was assembled on the anniversary of the birthday of the nation and filled with the spirit of the Grand General and Chieftain who established our independence. We seek to restore the government of the Republic to the hands of the plain people with which class it originated. The Omaha platform called for a wide range of social reforms including a reduction in the working day, a safe, sound, and flexible national currency, assistance to farmers with the financing of their labors, fair and liberal pensions for ex-union soldiers and sailors, the direct election of senators, single terms for presidents and vice presidents, the legislative system known as the initiative and referendum, the unperverted Australian or secret ballot system, the nationalization of the railroads, the telegraph and the telephone systems, a postal savings bank, a graduated income tax, and the free and unlimited coinage of silver. In referencing the Omaha platform, Senator George Norris of Nebraska suggested the wealth of the super-rich had to begin flowing to all the people from whom it was originally taken. The populists, or People's Party, went on to capture 11 seats in the United States House of Representatives, several governors, and the state legislatures of Kansas, Nebraska, and North Carolina. In 1892, presidential nominee and former former Greenbacker James P. Weaver received over a million popular votes and won four states, Colorado, Kansas, Idaho, and Nevada, and 22 electoral votes. The party's legislative majorities were thereafter able to elect several United States Senators. Taken as a whole, the electoral accomplishments of the Populist Party represent the high watermark for a United States third party after the Civil War. In 1896, the Populists abandoned the Omaha platform and endorsed Democratic nominee William Jenning Bryan on the basis of a single plank free silver platform. The first goal of the Omaha platform was to increase the coinage of silver and gold at 16 to 1 ratio. The Omaha platform suggested a federal loans system so that farmers could get the money they needed. The platform also called for the elimination of private banks. The platform proposed a system of federal storage facilities for the farmers' crops. The objective was to allow the farmers to control the pricing of their products. The Omaha platform proposed a special taxing system for them so that they would have to pay taxes depending on how much money they made. They also sought for an eight-hour workday and the direct election of senators as opposed to their being elected by state legislatures. These main goals of the Omaha platform were all focused on helping rural and working-class Americans. After 1894, populists emphasized the demand for free coinage of silver, rather than other goals such as state-run railroads. Uh, The platform did not appeal to the more urban areas of the country where wage earners were working in industrial jobs. The platform's only clear attempt to appeal to northerners in the east was the clause mentioning uh, pensions to ex-union soldiers. The Populist Party dissolved before World War Two, as members were unable to meet in Omaha for the party's semi-centennial celebration, and for the reason and for the reason that many of the party's values have been accepted by other more dominant political parties, I think that meant to say World War One, actually, and that's from Wikipedia um, on the Omaha platform. So we're going to pull up the Omaha platform, and we're going to go ahead and just uh, take a look at it, and uh, we're going to go ahead and see what it has to say here.
All right, so the Populist Party platform of 1892, the Populist Party, more commonly known as the Pop, the People's Party, more commonly known as the Populist Party, was organized in St. Louis in 1892 to represent the common folk, especially farmers, against the entrenched interests of railroads, bankers, processors, corporations, and the politicians in league with such interests. At its first national convention in Omaha, Nebraska, in July 1892, the party nominated James K. Weaver for president and ratified the so-called Omaha platform drafted by Ignatius Donnelly of Minnesota. And it goes like this. Assembled upon the 116th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the People's Party of America in their first national convention, invoking upon their action the blessing of Almighty God, put forth in the name and on behalf of the people of this country the following preamble and declaration of principles. Preamble. The conditions which surround us best justify our cooperation. We meet in the midst of a nation brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin. Corruption dominates the ballot box, the legislatures, the Congress, and touches even the ermine of the bench. The people are demoralized. Most of the states have been compelled to isolate the voters at the polling places to prevent universal intimidation and bribery. The newspapers are largely subsidized or muzzled, public opinion silenced, business prostrated, homes covered with mortgages, labor impoverished, and the land concentrating in the hands of capitalists. The urban workmen are denied the right to organize for self-protection. Imported, pauperized labor beats down their wages. A hireling standing army unrecognized by our laws is established to shoot them down, and they are rapidly degenerating into European conditions. The fruits of the toil of millions are badly stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few, unprecedented in the history of mankind. And the possessors of these, in turn, despise the republic and endanger liberty. From the same prolific womb of governmental injustice, we breed the two great classes, tramps and millionaires. The national power to create money is appropriated to enrich bondholders, a vast public debt payable in legal tender currency has been funded into gold-bearing bonds, thereby adding millions to the burdens of the people. Silver, which has been accepted as coin since the dawn of history, has been demonetized to add to the purchasing power of gold by decreasing the value of all forms of property as well as human labor, and the supply of currency is purposely abridged to fatten usurers bankrupt enterprise and enslave industry. A vast conspiracy against mankind has been organized on two continents, and it is rapidly taking possession of the world. If not met and overthrown at once, it forebodes terrible social convulsions, the destruction of civilization, or the establishment of an absolute despotism. We have witnessed for more than a quarter of a century the struggles of the two great political parties for power and plunder, while grievous wrongs have been inflicted upon the suffering people. We charge that the controlling influences dominating both these parties have permitted the existing dreadful conditions to develop without serious effort to prevent or restrain them. Neither do they now promise us any substantial reform. They have agreed together to ignore, in the coming campaign, every issue but one. They propose to drown the outcries of a plundered people with the uproar of a sham battle over the tariff so that capitalists, corporations, national banks, rings, trusts, watered stock, the demonetization of silver, and the oppressions of the users may all be lost sight of. They propose to sacrifice our homes, lives, and children on the altar of mammon to destroy the multitude in order to secure corruption funds from the millionaires. Assembled on the anniversary of the birthday of the nation and filled with the spirit of the Grand General and Chief who established our independence, we seek to restore the government of the Republic to the hands of the plain people with which class it originated.
We assert our purposes to be identical with the purposes of the National Constitution, to form a more perfect union and establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Our country finds itself confronted by conditions for which there is no precedent in the history of the world. Our annual agricultural productions amount to billions of dollars in value, which must, within a few weeks or months, be exchanged for billions of dollars worth of commodities consumed in their production. The existing currency supply is wholly inadequate to make this exchange. The results are falling prices, the formation of combines and rings, the impoverishment of the producing class. We pledge ourselves that if given power, we will labor to correct these evils by wise and reasonable legislation. In accordance with the terms of our platform, we believe that the power of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded, as in the case of the Postal Service, as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teaching of experience shall justify, to the end that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in the land. Platform. We declare, therefore, first, that the union of the labor forces of the United States this day consummated shall be permanent and perpetual. May its spirit enter into all hearts for the salvation of the republic and the uplifting of mankind. Second, wealth belongs to him who creates it, and every dollar taken from industry without an equivalent is robbery. If any will not work, neither shall he eat. The interests of rural and civil labor are the same. Their enemies are identical. Third, we believe that the time has come when the railroad corporations will either own the people or the people must own the railroads. And should the government enter upon the work of owning and managing all railroads, we should favor an amendment to the Constitution by which all persons engaged in the government service shall be placed under a civil service regulation of the most rigid character so as to prevent the increase of the power of the national administration by the use of such additional government employees. Finance. We demand a national currency safe, sound, and flexible issued by the general government only, a full legal tender for all debts, public and private, and that without the use of banking corporations, a just, equitable, and efficient means of distribution direct to the people at a tax not to exceed 2% per annum to be provided as set forth in the sub-treasury plan of the Farmers Alliance or a better system, also by payments in discharge of its obligations for public improvements. We demand free and unlimited coinage of silver and gold at the present legal ratio of 16 to 1. We demand that the amount of circulating medium be speedily increased to not less than $50 per capita. We demand a graduated income tax. We believe that the money of the country should be kept as much as possible in the hands of the people, and hence we demand that all state and national revenue shall be limited to the necessary expenses of the government, economically and honestly administered. We demand that postal savings banks be established by the government for the safe deposit of the earnings of the people and to facilitate exchange. Transportation. Transportation being a means of exchange and a public necessity, the government should own and operate the railroads in the interest of the people. The telegraph and telephone, like the post office system, being a necessity for the transmission of news, should be owned and operated by the government in the interests of the people. Land. The land, including all the natural sources of wealth, is the heritage of the people and should not be monopolized for speculative purposes. An alien ownership of land should be prohibited. All land now held by railroads and other corporations in excess of their actual needs and all lands now owned by aliens should be reclaimed by the government and held for actual settlers only. Expression of Sentiments 
Your Committee on Platform and Resolutions beg leave unanimously to report the following. Whereas other con questions have been presented for our consideration, we hereby submit the following. Not as part of the platform of the People's Party, but as resolutions expressive of the sentiment of this convention. Number one, resolved that we demand a free ballot and a fair count in all elections and pledge ourselves to secure it to every legal voter without federal intervention through the adoption by the states of the unperverted Australian or secret ballot system. Number two, resolved that the revenue derived from a graduated income tax should be applied to the reduction of the burden of taxation now levied upon the domestic industries of this country. Number three, resolved that we pledge our support to fair and liberal pensions to ex-union soldiers and sailors. Number four, resolved that we condemn the fallacy of protecting American labor under the present system, which opens our ports to the pauper and criminal classes of the world and crowds out our wage earners. And we denounce the present ineffective laws against contract labor and demand the further restriction of undesirable immigration. Number five, resolved that we cordially sympathize with the efforts of organized working men to shorten the hours of labor and demand a rigid enforcement of the existing eight-hour law on government work and ask that a penalty clause be added to the said law. Number six, resolved that we regard the maintenance of a large standing army of mercenaries known as the Pinkerton system as a menace to our liberties and we demand its ab abolition. Number seven, resolved that we commend to the favorable consideration of the people and the reform press the legislative system known as the initiative and referendum. Number eight, resolved that we favor a constitution, constitutional provision limiting the office of president and vice president to one term and providing for the election of senators of the United States by a direct vote of the people. 9. Resolved that we oppose any subsidy or national aid to any private corporation for any purpose. 10. Resolved that this convention sympathizes with the Knights of Labor and their righteous contest with the tyrannical combine of clothing manufacturers of Rochester and declare it to be a duty of all who hate tyranny and oppression to refuse to purchase the goods made by the said manufacturers or to patronize any merchants who sell such goods. And that is the end of the Omaha platform, also known as the People's Party Platform of 1892. That was at their inaugural convention, and they were one of the only um, short-lived third political parties. Um, and again, my great-great-grandfather, Omer Madison Kem, was a congressman from Nebraska as a populist. My name is Chris Christensen. If you like this content, please like and subscribe, and check out some of the other videos on Omer Madison Kem, American History, the True History of Populism, and check out our nightly podcast at 7 p.m. on YouTube Live, um, Politics Out West, where we cover Oregon politics and just generally everything political. So check on back. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe. We are trying to get to a thousand subscribers. So help us out.